some elaborations and uh, comments and also uh, improvements or enhancements to the book. And today, uh, inshallah, I'm going to continue. Okay, for uh, chapter one and chapter two of the of that book, which is the knowledge management from Islamic perspective. So this is going into uh, more details into the philosophy uh, of knowledge uh, management. So I put there some sort of like a cosmo or you know galaxy, okay, uh, so that <laughs> we have the feeling, okay, before we start uh, the session. Okay, so um, what we will look at, okay, on this slide is that. What's the aim of the uh, knowledge management? Okay, so what are the aims? Uh, because it is the aims uh, that would guide, okay, that would lay down uh, the path, okay, uh, towards achieving a successful uh, knowledge management uh, implementation. Okay, so on the right hand side, okay, you will see that there is a, a three uh, rectangular. Uh, container of information uh, so you can see here the first one is peace okay uh, surely from the islamic perspective you know salam islam so this is peace okay we are spreading peace okay we are spreading submission to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so that should be the peak or the uh, highest level okay of the aims or the commitment when we say we want to implement uh, knowledge management from the Islamic uh, perspective. On the other side, on the on the side, okay, of peace is justice. Okay, so that means we must uphold justice because Islam is the region of justice. Okay, and of course certainty. You know, even in Surah uh, Al Baqarah, okay, uh, at the beginning, you know, the opening statement it says, you know, Alif Lam Mim, and then. This uh, kita has no doubt, so meaning that it is about all about certainty because we cannot uh, work on something when there is doubt. Okay, we have to settle the doubts first, then we can we be certain, and then we can uh, proceed. Okay, so I'm going into further details now. So, for example, like with regard to peace, we have in Surah Al Maidah, verse 16, uh, with the meaning of by which Allah guides those who pursue His pleasure to the ways of peace, okay, that's the word peace there, and brings them out from darknesses into the light by his permission and guides them to a straight path. So they have, this ayat has many keywords that we can use and we can apply in knowledge management, research and also field of study, okay. But the one that I'm highlighting here is the word peace. So it's not something strange to us Muslims that Whenever we implement a policy or even when we teach okay, in a particular domain such as knowledge management, we must make sure that the word peace is there as part of the aim. Secondly, on the justice, okay, in the same Surah Al-Ma'idah, verse 8, the meaning, O you who have believed, be persistently standing firm for Allah, witness in justice. Okay, so we have to be witnesses in justice. And don't let the hatred of a people prevent you from being just. Okay, there's no biasness and there is no injustice. When it comes to knowledge, you must appreciate everyone's knowledge. Be just, that is nearer to righteousness, and fear Allah. Indeed, Allah is acquainted with what you do. Okay, and then for certainty, okay, in Surah At Takathur, uh, that means Surah 102 and verse 5. We have no, if you only knew with knowledge of certainty, okay? So because most of the words say no doubts, okay? So uh, just to reflect uh, certainty in a, in a particular context, okay? Because Atakasur is also about collecting wealth, etc. So this is, uh, this is why I chose this ayat to refer to certainty in today's uh, lecture. So that's, we are done with that part, okay? We are going to go through all the slides with all these three uh, main aims of knowledge management. So let's look at another component that we can also call as an aim, okay, of knowledge management, which is, which is amana, okay? And we translated that into English as trust, okay? So what exactly is amana? Amana means that we are responsibility or we are shouldering the responsibility to be just okay 
And when we say that, when we say amanah, it's not just simply uh, ruling in social political sense. So that means we are holding a post, or we are holding a position, and we say that this is amanah. So we use all the context related to social political, and then we try to govern an organization or you know, lay out a knowledge management system, for example, or practices. Okay, it's not just simply that. Okay, and it is also not simply controlling nature in scientific sense. Okay, so it means that we are not doing, uh, we are not implementing knowledge uh, management just because everything must have done experimentation or has evidences that derive from science only. Okay, there are many other ways okay, to secure knowledge and to implement knowledge in the framework of knowledge management. Okay, and the last but not the least under amanah is that what should we do, what should we understand is that amanah means ruling, governing, controlling and maintaining of man, that means ourself by himself. Okay, by our fitrah. Okay, not we derive from, let's say, uh, uh, you know, uh, the higher one, okay, or animals, or the kingdom of animals, and then try to reflect that on ourselves, saying that we are cousins to such and such animals. Okay, let me give credits, okay, on this part of uh, Amana, okay, I borrowed it from Naqib Al Atas. Okay, and this is the book, and it's a very, I must say that it's a very good book. The title of the book is Preliminary Thoughts on the Nature of Knowledge and the Definition and Aims of Education. So it's a very nice, uh, nicely uh, written and explained by a great scholar. Even though this is in 1977, but it's still valid till now, okay, because this book is kind of futuristic and so contemporary. And as for the ayat given by uh, Professor uh, Said Nakib al Atas, is that uh, in Surah Al Ahzab, verse 72, we, we say uh, with the meaning of, indeed, we offered the trust, amanah, okay, to the heavens and the earth and the mountains, and they have and they declined to bear it and feared it. But man undertook to bear it, indeed, he was unjust and ignorant. Okay, so this is really a capsule meaning of uh, amana. Okay, so let's move on. Okay, uh, this is also from Nakib Al Atas. Okay, which is about change, development, and progress. So uh, he talked about this, and I have redrawn it. Okay, from his text into this particular context or frame. Okay, for 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 the session today. So what about change, what about development, what about progress? Okay, we heard about advancement, advanced society, uh, civilized society, progressive society, but uh, you know, and we have been hearing it for so many years, you know, dev developed country, de developing country, and then we must do change management. So of course, all these are there in knowledge management. Okay, but however, let's, look at it from the Islamic perspective, okay, under the Islamic light. Okay, so what we have here is that in Surah Al-Ma'idah, verse 3, okay, this day I have perfected for you your religion and completed my favor upon you and have approved for you Islam as religion. So actually, what does change mean, okay? So does it mean that because we change, because we have doubts, okay, we change because we are not progressing okay and we wonder what's the matrix or measurement of progress uh, you know faces uh, and etc okay but actually change means that when we discovered okay and after we analyzed we found that we are not on the straight path okay and therefore we have to change course change to the right direction okay this is the meaning that we should maintain okay, uh, throughout the sessions today, okay. So here, because why? Because actually our religion is already perfected and it is Islam, okay, from the favor of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So meaning that it is there, okay. It's just that we have to keep ourselves on the straight path or the right path, okay, reaching to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
So development, progress and perfection must refer to the spiritual and real nature of man. Okay, so meaning that when we say that we are developing, okay, it must be really in the context of man, man and woman. Okay, man here in general term. And then the progress, okay, we are going into the direction of improving ourselves from the Islamic point of view. And of course, perfection is different than perfectionist. Okay, perfection means that we do things perfectly, okay, to the best our to the best of ability. Perfectionist is quite different. It's more on the negative negative side. Okay, so what does it mean by progress? Okay, I'm using Said Naki Al Atas definition, definite direction. So they must be definite because it's very difficult to give instruction and to uh, follow instructions, okay, or to work together where the direction is not definite or it's very blur, okay, and foggy. So that's quite difficult in the dark, okay. So it is a definite direction aligned to a final purpose meant to be achieved in life, okay. But of course, the second part of the definition is quite subjective, needs to elaborate further because it has several uh, meaning, okay. But I think the best way is to say that according to the to the fitrah. Okay, so now once change is there, we found that our organizations, our system, our policy, our practices, our model did not really uh, walk on the straight path. Okay, therefore, we need the guidance. Okay, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows this already in advance. Okay. So he's our creator. So he says that, you know, for us to read, Ihdina Surah Wal Mustaqib. So that means guide us to the straight path. So therefore, we must develop ourselves on the straight path, as mentioned in Surah Al Fatiha, uh, verse 6. Okay, direct ourselves back to the straight path and the true path. Okay, and then how to know the straight and the true path? Okay, because the materials or knowledge management is not very clear on this, all right? But we don't worry, we have an Islamic sources and evidences, okay? So the continuation of the ayat, which is ayat 7, it says that the path of those upon whom you have bestowed favor, not of those who have evoked your anger or those who are astray. So that means in doing the knowledge development uh, or knowledge management development, so we must remember that the change, the development, and the progress must be on the uh, must be progressing, must be on the straight and the true path, and it must be Islam as practiced by the Prophet, his noble companions, their followers, and Muslims after them. So, as a conclusion to this particular slide, okay, we can say that it, the endeavor, the effort, the hard, the hard struggle entails change is the development. That means we work hard to do the changes, that's called development. And the return of that development is progress. Okay, so try to have that in mind. Uh, please create our mental uh, framework in this manner so that it's much easier to follow later on when we try to operationalize it from the point of view of knowledge management. Okay, still continue with the uh, prominent scholar, uh, al -Atas, okay, on the justice. Okay, what does it mean? Philosophically, it means a harmonious condition whereby everything or being is in its right and proper place. That means put things the right place. Okay, and some at, at the right moment. Okay, because when it, when it refers to uh, certain uh, court or legal cases, normally time is also uh, an element or a factor in that particular uh, situation. And then wisdom, okay, God given knowledge in such wise that it causes the occurrence of justice. So they are all connected. Okay, with wisdom, then inshallah justice is there uh, as well. If it's not, if it is injustice, then it is not wisdom. And then the one which is very interesting, I found that interesting that I would like to incorporate into because Al Atas mentioned uh, in terms of education, knowledge, knowledge okay, in his view. But I'm going to do that in knowledge management. Okay. So the adab is the discipline, disciplining the mind and the soul. Okay, let's look at 
uh, I'm going to use the uh, the direct meaning okay, of adapt. So it's very interesting for me because even when we are doing knowledge management, we have like uh, you know an incentive for people who have been sharing knowledge. One of them is to invite the person who has been sharing to a banquet or a CEO dinner or luncheon. Okay, other than monetary uh, incentives. So I like this one very much. Adapt inviting to a banquet, okay, where the host, the person who invited the guest, is a man of honor and prestige. Okay, just have that in our mind, try to imagine it. And the guest, the people who are present, who are invited, are those in the host, host estimation. So that means if I'm the person of honor and prestige, I invited uh, some, of, uh, some of you. Okay, so that means in my estimation, I estimate, I felt that you deserve such an honor to be, to be invited. Okay, so those guests, they are the people of refined qualities and upbringing. Okay, who are expected to behave as befits their station in speech, conduct and etiquette. Okay, the enjoyment of fine food is greatly enhanced by noble and gracious company and be partaken of in accordance with the rules of refined conduct. So this is the literal meaning of adapt, the direct meaning. Okay. So what can we say? Okay, is that knowledge is the food of life and soul. Okay. Acquisition of good qualities and attributes of mind and soul. To perform the correct as against the erroneous action of right as against wrong. And we preserve ourselves from disgrace. So this is what it meant by adapt as a whole in terms of literal uh, meaning. Okay. So now, as I mentioned to you earlier, as promised, okay. So we're going to have those philosophy, especially from the great scholar, Nakib Al-Atas, into the knowledge management syllabus or if you remember okay i've covered this already last session okay because it's an overview and now i'm going into the details of it on the experiences learning time and value okay so if you remember this diagram it's about what how when and why okay under the knowledge management and what I've added, newly added, is the integration of justice, wisdom, and adapt. So this table consists of the same sentences, okay, but we are putting in and replacing in with the vocabulary that's there in the title. Okay, so for example, when it comes to what, we are in the organization and holding a position, okay, and directing our own unit, for example, regardless of wherever we are. So we say, what knowledge do we have? Because we want to manage knowledge, we want to do knowledge management. So what knowledge do we have? Okay. And what knowledge do we need? Okay, what we already have and what do we need? But most often, from many research, we found that the first statement are normally not there and not really thought of. Okay, at the point of trying to solve a problem or also to complete a project. Okay, so translating knowledge, because if you remember from the previous session, I mentioned that knowledge and experiences are almost quite equivalent because, uh, you know, for example, when we shortlisted candidate and we asked during the interview, what are, what are your experiences, okay? So what experiences do we have? This is more than knowledge, okay? So experiences is more than knowledge, okay? It's adding, okay? Because there are things that we do with our hands that we write, so that's an explicit knowledge. And it's also when we solve a problem during meetings, we give brainstorming session. So this is experiences which are developed from the tested knowledge. So what experiences do we have? What experiences do we need? Because we already uh, hired a person, okay, let's say five years ago, in five years time, this person has developed experiences. So we must not just uh, consider knowledge as in certificates or degree, but also the experiences that they have in our own institutions or organization. The next one on the how, how should knowledge be acquired? 
how should knowledge be spread? And this is very important because we need to acquire. Okay, we have cases where employees, okay, they will just take up knowledge, but they will not share. Okay, so acquisition and sharing is very are very important in knowledge management. It's very, they are very vital. So how should learning be acquired? How should learning be spread? Because as I said earlier, when throughout our service at, at a particular organization, we have learned something. So how to acquire learning, especially when it is a new problem, new requirements, and how to spread the learning so that we gain from one another and it can be captured and known as explicit knowledge. Another one on the question of when, okay, this is more related to time. When would knowledge be on our side? When would knowledge be costly to us? Sometimes we have to send someone for training and it is very costly. It could be you know, a few hundreds uh, in European, in Euro money, you know, in Euro dollar. So it could be that amount, okay, which is very expensive here in Malaysia, for example. So we convert that because it's not just the knowledge, but it's also the time. When would time be on our side? So that means we really have to train this person or to expose this person to the industry, for example, to gain the real, the real experiences, okay, hands-on experiences. So for how long? Three months, six months, one year, okay? So that means would the three years be on our side, meaning that that person will come back and serve the organization or they will, they will break the bonding or the agreement. So how should that be? So when would time be costly to us? Okay. So the last question under the why, okay, which is value, why should we consider this knowledge? So that means we say that, okay, we are going to implement a certain project on the environment, for example, to take care of the taxonomy of the environment, the climate changes. So why should we consider someone's knowledge in database, for example? Okay. And if there is a need, should we invest? Why should we invest on this knowledge? So therefore, in this, this kind of question, that knowledge is actually value. Why should we consider this value? Because everyone is valuable, but you know, in this context, which one give offer the best value? Why should we invent on this value? So altogether, in a nutshell, what does it mean is that knowledge management, when we integrate justice, wisdom, and adapt in all of these questions, it's actually about identifying, analyzing, planning, organizing, monitoring, controlling, reviewing, and appraising knowledge assets. So the first one, the first two, identifying and analyzing, is the what. Planning and organizing is the how. Monitoring, monitoring and controlling, okay, monitoring and controlling is the when. And then reviewing and appraising is the, is the why, okay. So now we have, okay, so if you can see on the right hand side, okay, that is, ha that's have been presented in the last session, okay, in the previous session. And the title is the time and space based data. Okay, now the elaborations of that is under the context of change, development and progress. Okay, under the historical data, of course we have here just to uh, review, we have recall, we have what happened, why happened, how happened. Okay, so when we translate that into change, development and progress, we have regression because for the change we want to know how much we regress, okay, and or maybe how many paths that we have regressed, okay, and then classification is basically which one, okay, that we have regressed, okay. So now under the development, we need to do data mining to look into the data. And this method or this tool is already there in the market, in the industry, and in many organizations, okay. So, and then we do the statistics. And then of course, AI is there, okay, to do an effective uh, analysis, okay, to read the pattern. So we have the machine learning. This is done by the machine. As for the progress, we can do historical analogy. So that means we can take, let's say, another organizations in terms of their service or in terms of their product, 
and we studied the, histo the history of that service or product or that organizations. And then after that, we try to uh, study it okay, for our own product and services or for our own systems. This is what it meant by historical analogy. And of course, it has to be a complete history of those products and services that we are trying to study and compare. Another one is trends projection. This is also a whole lot of data, a okay, huge amount of data, if possible, a complete history as well, where you need to do the trends projection. So this is basically mathematical uh, model and equation. As for the emerging data, okay, uh, trying to remember, okay, trying to recall uh, the previous session, I asked what will happen, how will happen, and why will happen. Okay, this is in the emerging and then it's coming in the in the future. Okay, so the change will be done through Delphi method, through scenarios and through sensitivity analysis. Then we know we need to change course or not. But of course, in the view of that straight path that I've mentioned earlier from Surah Al Fatiha, and then the development. Okay, instead of artificial intelligence machine learning. We have the deep learning, that means it is deeper, trying to imitate the human's uh, way of making decisions. And this is exactly what we say, learning by example. Okay, but if, of course it is more of algorithm and robotic. And then continuous intelligence means that internet of things. So since it's a network and every office is giving data, so they are also communicating. Okay, so we don't, I want to have data from everywhere, duplications, uh, etc. So we want to have a very continuous uh, intelligence. As for the progress, we go for automatic insights. So it is more insight on the business process. Okay, it is learning uh, by example where people uh, will enhance okay the computerized processes and also a graph database. So that means we can see connection from one idea to another idea, from one person to another person, and from one office to another office. Okay, so it is there, and inshallah it will still be there uh, in the in about 2030, the year of 2030. Okay, this one is from Prof. Auzan, and I've added some more resources on the left hand side. This is the one that I've shown in the preview session, which is the last session where we have the graph here. Okay, so now trying to transfer that into knowledge management per se. Okay, that means operationalize it. So we start from data. Okay, so we have data analytics because knowledge management requires a high volume of analysis. Okay, exhaustive one. Okay, exhaustive means doesn't mean that it takes months and years to churn, but actually it is more of comprehensiveness. Okay, so data analytics, where we are going to use it, it is called data driven insights. And what is it about? It is about KM processes. So that means we pick up data from all the checkpoints or from all the nodes of our of our units, okay, or our, at our organizations. Information, it is information analytics, which means information driven insights about decisions. Okay. So that means there are many decisions have been done and many cases have been tabled and each one doesn't resemble, doesn't fully resemble one another. So it is possible that uh, we need to have more information on that decisions. Knowledge, knowledge analytics, and this is about priority. Which priority? Okay, so we have to rank those priority. And wisdom, I'm not sure to call it wisdom analytics or not, but I will just, so I just put a question mark. Maybe one of us here can come up with a better uh, terminology for that. So this is about goals, okay? Wisdom driven insights about goals. And what's the goal? Okay, in our context from the Islamic perspective, of course, in this case, uh, if I uh, borrowed the idea from Prof. Zan, it is merciful and compassion. And of course, from uh, Nakib al atas is about peace and of course I've added also the uh, justice and uh, certainty. Okay, all right, so the right hand side is already there in the previous session. This is under knowledge management components. So I'm going to give the operational uh, meaning okay, to the hardware. Hardware within the wear of the system 
and then hardware within the organization here. Okay. So there are also term being used by CCLFI, it says head and the heart. That means not just the cognitive, but also the emotions, the sentiments, anything in the heart. Okay. And then for Milton, it said mind and heart. Okay, so that means we must have sensitivity, etc. And then knowledge management has a heart. So as what has been used here, heart, with two chambers. Connect and collect through conversation and content. So it's more of heart to heart talking, okay, heart to heart sharing of knowledge. And of course, the most simplest and the most common word uh, definition or implementation of the philosophical idea is knowledge sharing. And then we have culture. This is the European uh, cultural parliament. And of course, for uh, Professor Naki Alatas, it is adapt. Okay, I interpret it to be uh, adapt. Okay, as the conclusion, okay, so uh, I like this slide. Okay, it's a connection here. So as you can see, uh, the change development and progress that will give an input, okay, that will help to decide or to draw a clear direction for knowledge management. Peace, justice, and certainty that will also guide us to go for a clear direction. And then the wisdom, adapt, and hardware. And that will also contribute to it. So all these three approaches or paths okay, will give a clearer path, a single one, in which we say this is from the Islamic perspective. And hopefully this is the straight and the true path. Okay? Because we just do not live here in this world but also in the hereafter. So that's all. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Prof. A solid 30-minute uh, lecture. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. <laughs> uh, we, uh, okay, br uh, brothers, sisters, please raise hand or mention your name. I can uh, unmute you or you can write question uh, on the chat. Uh, Have one comment from Brother Faisal: Intelligent analytics, perhaps instead of wisdom analytics. Can you say that again? Uh, there's a short comment there from Brother okay. Faisal: okay. Intelligent analytics, perhaps, or instead of wisdom analytics, can we use wisdom analytics instead of uh, intelligent analytics? You mean the intelligence analytics to 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 what level? Can uh, I just to what level? Not sure. Maybe if I still want to ask directly, I can unmute a little from Singapore. That means you are uh, instead of wisdom analytics, it is intelligence analytics. Okay, so as I said earlier, I'm opening the wisdom level to further elaborations and discussions, perhaps further. Uh, research, we can say intelligent analytics, just that when it comes to intelligent analytics, we often refer to robotics, okay? Uh, while uh, uh, wisdom analytics is more towards a human, okay? But of course, maybe we can always refine uh, it to be, you know, something that a human level, so we can refine the word intelligent analytics to refer to uh, somebody who is wise, okay, because wisdom might be too abstract uh, to be implemented at every level or every organization, okay. But we can consider the word uh, intelligence analytics. It is from Sister uh, Sumaya. I like to seek clarification on the last slide if the Islamic perspective is a linear process. Okay, on the last slide, when I do that linear line, okay, it doesn't have to be a linear process. It's just to say that it is a straight path in terms of the abstract thinking. Okay, uh, it's only to uh, to show a straight line. Okay, but if we are going to do certain equations or certain uh, you know uh, line estimation, then it is not doesn't have to be a, a linear process because our life is not all linear, okay? Hey, Brother Salman Akram, can you unmute yourself, Brother Salman? 
Okay. But I have a small question. Maybe it's not a yes. Uh, when you when you characterize that uh, historical data and emerging data on the time and space based data. Uh, on the process, you said like uh, the, uh, the, when come the historical data, it's like what happened, why happened, and how happened. That's the order you said. So early also you said that is what is about analytic, and how is about predictive, and uh, how is about model. Am I correct? Is the way yes, I think. Yes. Correct. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Correct. At the same time, but but when come the emerging data, the order was changed. Is it just a maybe a typing mis? This one like we went. No, no, start no, no. A typing, it's not a typing mistake. I'm so happy <laughs> you, you observe that you have sharp eyes. Okay, so yes, uh, it is the correct order. Yeah, there's no mistake uh, because for the historical, normally the model, the predictive one will come at the end, and then for the emerging, it is in the middle. Yeah, okay, okay. so that means so for that means so for the emerging data, so after we analyze, we have a model, then we are going to predict. Is it the way? For the emerging data, so uh, can you say that again? I don't hear uh, you. Yeah, for the emerging data, first we will have what will happen. Okay, for the emerging data, can you hear me? Okay. So that is still the analytic part. What? Yeah, yeah. What is the analytic part? Yes. So, so how will be the model in the in the emerging data? How will be the model of the? Yes, the model and then the prediction. Yes. So the, the order will be analytic. And model, then predictive. Yes. The emerging data. Okay. Yes. Thank you, ma'am. Okay, welcome. Okay. We have a uh, next question by uh, Habibu Yunusa. I want to ask that what should be done to those scholars who abuse their knowledge, thereby misleading the uneducated members of the society? Okay. <laughs> Normally we have a penalty, okay? <laughs> uh, because I, well, I was doing this lecture, I found a case, you know, uh, where they tried to do it in a subtle manner, and it's about a journalist, you know, who, uh, who's actually has a high scholastic uh, credibility, and they, they abuse. He abused the knowledge in the form that, uh, you know, he have. Uh, like say 80% facts and then the other part is uh, knowledge based built upon uh, fabricated data okay and uh, people you know at first were supporting and reading his writings okay this is united states and canada okay and then what happened was that after that they found that uh, he has abused uh, the knowledge in the form that is not reporting exactly as the data and at the same time he's manipulating it for a certain reason and he was fired okay but of course that was in the early years in the 70s okay he was he was fired and then after that in another case uh, you know they were uh, they were uh, stopped from being uh, practicing uh, anywhere so not just fired in one organization, but uh, that person, another person was also, is of the same case, was also, was also uh, not hired anywhere uh, for a certain years until uh, that person has a better resume uh, to be shown for work purpose. Okay, so yes, normally there's an academic penalty uh, and also uh, sometimes, for example, uh, if, if there is an abuse in the form of discrediting okay and normally the journals uh, will the journal editors will advertise in the next issue of that particular journal and that is really really hurtful so as academicians and also as a knowledge management practitioner uh, because we are dealing with knowledge uh, and and uh, anything that is authentic and reliable reliability and validity so that is considered a severe punishment okay so maybe there are some more but uh, I haven't come across to that much yet. Okay. Okay, Prof. Um, how do you explain this digital fatigue nowadays? People are so exposed to gadgets and things. Digital. Digital fatigue. You be uh, you being too exposed oh, to digital okay, items. Yeah, yeah. Fatigue, yeah. Impression fatigue. Yeah. Yeah. How do you explain okay. that? So digital fatigue. Yeah. So that's why. 
uh, in knowledge management, not everything is digital. Okay, so normally uh, we have a certain hours, and this is where the adapt and the wisdom and justice is there. Yes. Yeah, so we, we don't want everybody to be fatigued because the one who will not be fatigued is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So for example, if you look at the graph that Prof. Azad has drawn for his book, for his chapter, so what happened was that he has compassion because the most compassionate is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because otherwise we will be fatigued. For example, I give you a simple one, let's say nurses, nurses at hospital, and they have been working hours and hours, and especially also our frontliners, you know, at the time of COVID-19, if we don't handle them well, considering they are also human, etc. So they will have compassion fatigue. So the same thing as digital, we will have digital fatigue. So that's why there has to be a balance. And the word justice must appear there. I try to unmute Brother Idris. Brother Idris, can you unmute yourself? Or Sister Nusaiba. Nusaiba is some noise. Hello, Assalamualaikum. Yeah, uh, thank you, Prof, for this uh, enlightenment you have given to us. I needed to ask a question. Okay. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, 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 sure. Yeah, uh, sometimes some people, when they have knowledge and they disseminate uh, this knowledge to us in terms of maybe a fatwa or a judgment, and after that, they proceeded to have more knowledge about what they've told us. And they now discover that what they've told us in the past is not really obtainable. In some cases, these people doesn't come to us to come and tell us that, no, there's additional knowledge that I've said, what I said in the last year is no more obtainable, that this is what is obtainable now. But they now still come to us as if the, what they've done to us last is still the right thing. This thing is getting confusing. Because what we, from what you have said, that at every point in time, the knowledge management should be done in such a way that we should use ADAP. But these people did not come to us. For instance, maybe the level, like maybe when we are in school, they told us oh, there's no negativities in, 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 in uh, mathematics. And now we now believe that there is negativity whereby we can use do negative figure. When we are being taught in, in, in primary or elementary level, when these people now have the additional knowledge, they don't come to us to come and tell us, oh, this is how it is. How do we manage these people? Or what should we do to them? And they are our scholars, they are our stars, and we don't know what to do to them. And we then later find out that what they've taught us initially is not really obtainable. Okay, um, I will try to answer. If let's say I miss a certain points from your questions, just uh, remind me uh, on that points, okay? So, okay. Uh, all right. So basically, for the uh, for the scholars, okay, when they make a fatwa, okay, they are actually connecting to one situation or one scenario, okay. So meaning that uh, they they focus on that particular uh, what should I say area, okay. And that's why they ask the first question is, if you remember from the slide, okay, what knowledge do we need? What experiences do we need? Okay, so let me try um, to go back there. Okay, so later on, if you refer to my slide number five, okay, what knowledge do we have? What knowledge do we need? Okay, so this is where we identify and we analyze. So normally for a fatwa, it's always tied to a certain situation, okay? So that means when would knowledge be on our side? When would knowledge be costly to us? Okay, so that means perhaps another expert or scholars on the issues are not reachable, even may, may not be known. And this call is costly for us to go and find. And the time is not on our side because it's really an emergency situation. You know, people have been asking. So we need to to say something, to issue something, at least to make sure that people are calm and peace is achieved. And then after that, we release and try to explain and perhaps we do campaign, you know, uh, all these explanations, awareness, uh, etc. So I guess, you know, uh, when it comes to, uh, I think you mentioned about abuse, this now so as well, right? Brother Idris? Yes, yes. 
Yes, okay. So if somebody, a scholar, okay, uh, abuse, so normally abusive people, I would not call, I mean, people who abuse knowledge, I would not call scholars. But if I were to use your word, uh, normally after some deliberations, okay, because normally we have consensus and also a uh, uh, expert uh, pool of people, okay, and we do it musyawarah, okay, so therefore elaborations are made, so there are steps in the process of the fatwa, which is called the makasi al shari'ah or shari'ah intelligence, okay, so there are steps before reaching a fatwa, then normally the risk of error or no longer uh, valid, uh, usually uh, is, is very slim or very, very little. That's what I know of and I and I saw in many of the issuance of the fatwa because uh, things are changing, okay? With regards to the uh, previous or classical scholars, okay, the earlier years, okay, the earlier century uh, scholars, okay, normally it's very difficult for us, for us to write, to read, to understand at our time. So let's say if somebody has written it in let's say the 19th century and we are already here so therefore we can't understand much okay just to to share with you personally my experience when i did my phd thesis okay there was one article okay that i can i can read english i can understand english language document or article but the thing is that i don't understand what the talk, what the authors were talking about so I went to consult my supervisor and the first time he sent me back, he said, read again. The second time he said, read again. And then the third time, I was brave enough to tell him that these authors are referring to a certain event during their time. And I was not yet even born, okay? So I need to know what's that event. So he said, oh, I realized that, okay? Because he's much senior than me. So he guided me and he told me about the event. So this is how I learned. Okay, this is where we said, how should learning be acquired? Okay, so if we read a century, centuries ago scholars' writings, then we have to consider that what is their context, okay? What is their time, okay? All right? Thank I you so I much, Prof. Yeah, yeah. Dr. Saiba, now you are okay. Go ahead. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Wa alaikum salam. My question is that, here I'm trained. I'm a trained journalist, and part of the training we told not to expose certain secrets. For instance, when there is a crisis between the Muslims and the non-Muslims, for example, one of the parts is being cheated upon, and then you don't expose such. Or if there are killings, for instance, you are told to reduce the number to a certain amount. Is that also a kind of knowledge abuse or something like that? Okay. You're not reporting as you should be reporting. So I think this fall under the category, in my opinion, this fall under the category of the ethics of journalism. Okay. So I need I I believe you need to consult uh, the codes of conduct for journalists. Okay. And also uh, because as I've said earlier, uh, when it comes to amana, it's not just the social political uh, reason. Okay. Or context. Okay. So if it is under, uh, if, if you're trying to see it from the knowledge management, from Islamic perspective, um, view or context, then of course it is not right, okay? But actually, uh, I guess as journalists, you learn how to do reporting, right? Uh, so for example, you know, uh, this number is representing what, and that number is for what, okay? Uh, so normally, uh, in my field, in knowledge management, normally when we report, we just say uh, that data or that information affected uh, just how many people, okay? But we don't uh, reduce the number without uh, putting the number into the proper explanation. So this is in our area of knowledge management. But I believe in your case, uh, normally, uh, I believe you should refer to the Code of Conduct of Journalists and Journalism, okay? One from Sister uh, Bibi Jan, this is a good question. Can we start using the Islamic perspective framework in mind, collecting and analyzing data, looking for pattern extrapolating future trends, and conclude with the permission of the revealed knowledge? 
meaning that we already have our own framework. We just want to test the framework. You yes, understand you can do that. Yes, you can. You can do that because that's what I did just now. Okay, I give something from. I give the idea from Professor Nakit Al Atas, and then after that, put it in the knowledge management in terms at the operational level. Sorry, at the implementation level. And then after that, uh, we conclude with the uh, affirmation of the revealed uh, knowledge. But of course, in this case, I just give the conclusion, uh, but not the exact uh, running versus because I've done that earlier. You can do that. But normally, let me caution you, uh, as a professor and also as a lecturer, I have supervised many theses and also examiners to many theses, okay, because this is part of our job. Okay, normally I would uh, recommend and also advise those researchers, young researchers, okay, that when we, they do something like Islamic perspective, etc. So it's not just putting in the Quranic verse, okay, and just leave it like that, okay. Uh, normally, uh, what our advice would be is that you can use the Quranic text and then of course the Hadith and also the Tafsir, etc. Until it comes down into the research work that has been done under that light okay the light of al quran and in the light of the sunnah of the prophet and so on okay so you cannot stop at the just the quranic verse and then you start we start interpreting by ourselves uh, that should not be done because it's not the correct uh, framework normally we go by that hierarchy okay hierarchy of of knowledge or sources there okay uh, but the wazir can you unmute yourself our oh, brother from Guyana. Okay. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Um, in, re in respect to sharing information, particularly as the sister was asking the question in journalism, uh, we will have to look at the implication of sharing such information to the public. The, the kind of harm it does, or what are the benefits? So it's not just merely to say, okay, this is the correct thing, so we have to share it out. And the people who in authority, they will be able to advise. Because I can remember in 2005, we had a big flood in Guyana where more than 50% of the population was affected. However, the populace never knew the real cause of the flood. They just thought rain, it was just raining. But basically, our, we have a conservancy, and it, the dam was supposed to give way. So what the authorities did, they broke, broke part of the dam to allow the water to flow, rather than to allow, keep the water there. And if that would have happened, thousands of people would die. So they would have to do that. OK? So I, I believe in uh, knowledge management. We'll have to also take sure your position of the principle of mafsada or maslaha the harm and the benefits when we do sharing information. Thanks. Yeah, so that's why yeah. this is all about priority and the goals. And as mentioned in the previous session, the Makasi al Sharian or the Sharia intelligence, uh, which we will discuss in, uh, in the future, sessions in the future. Uh, but as of uh, now, because of your questions is that, yes, uh, sometimes we overlook, okay, we overlook uh, certain things because uh, the certainty um, component or the certainty segment has an, has a problem. It, it is so blur to us. We became so much uncertain and this is where we have to judge which one that we have uh, doubt okay and which one that we are not we are not certain and then we go back to the knowledge that we that we need yeah and it is very costly remember because I said earlier that when is it the knowledge would be costly? So that means a wrong, uh, wrong information or wrong analysis or wrong priorities will be costly. Even though we know how to do it on paper, but it costs lives. Okay, so that's why on the conclusion slide, it's all about goals. Yeah. Thank you, thank you so much, Prof. Um, I will invite you for the for closing remark, two three minutes before we close. Okay, so Alhamdulillah, so Jazakumullah Khair for your uh, attention, your attentive uh, listening, attentively listening and also for your good questions. I learned a lot as well. So I guess 
I could say that today's session is really, really a knowledge sharing. So Jazakumullah Khair. Okay, Prof. Um, I know that some of us want to uh, ask more questions. Uh, but now we learn that we only allow one question, then we'll, we'll mute everyone. So we don't want to debate <laughs> between the student and the lecturer. But inshallah, in real life, we can do that. But in our session, we control it in such a way. So thank you so much, Prof. Uh, we'll see you Bye, next man. week, inshallah, next Sunday, same time. And for others, uh, we have been having now our fourth week. Alhamdulillah, we have three more weeks to go. Allah will see you next week for another exciting class. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.